I'll start by introducing myself for those of you who, who don't know me. Um, so, as, as I said, I, was, I teach at the University of Greenwich. I'm actually a psychologist, and uh, of course, like all good psychologists, I, I started off as a rather screwed up teenager and went away and studied psychology. And well, you know, I'm a psychologist and I'm still screwed up, but I know why. So that's quite useful. <laughs> it's good for something. Um, <laughs> Uh, I mostly uh, teach at the University of Greenwich, uh, which is just over the water. I do a lot of research there on psychedelics, but not just. Uh, I also do some research when I'm not on psychedelics. Uh, <laughs> it's not as interesting, admittedly, uh, but... Um, so I do research on all the old states of consciousness, and uh, my main focus is exceptional human experience. So, is it plugged in? Oh, well, Try to replug it and I'll try, try it again. again. Let's see what happens. So, uh, so on an ordinary psychology degree, nothing's happening yet. At least I can see that that's something. An ordinary psychology degree, you get all the stuff in the middle. You know what happens to people. Uh, kind of social psychology, cognitive psychology, behavioural psychology, all the everyday stuff, and then you get all the, the things on one extreme of when things go wrong what we call clinical psychology or psychopathology. What you don't get on an average psychology degree is all the other stuff on the other end of the spectrum of unusual and exceptional experiences, the things that like uh, Rupert is talking about, however they are quite uh, common and everyday for a lot of people, but rather they are exceptional, they're not pathological. So I'm trying to kind of inject that bit onto an ordinary psychology degree uh, at this moment of re-enchantment in a way, which I think we so desperately need. So, one of the things I've been doing uh, as a co-founder with Dave of Breaking Conventions, so just to re-enchant the academy somewhat, we've been organising a, a psychedelic research con convention at the University of Greenwich for several years. Uh, and it started out initially in uh, 2011 in Canterbury. We didn't think anybody would actually turn up, and so we were delighted to find there was 500 people came along to that event. Uh, and since then it's been ever-expanding. We uh, have a growing body of people coming to our conference uh, every two years. This isn't just a plug, however, this is to show that this is really a, a renaissance of interest in psychedelic research that is going on currently. Um, so the last uh, edition we had over a thousand people coming and we're going to be doing that again next August. That's the plug over with. Uh, my own research on exceptional human experience uh, so it explores all the phenomena that Rupert's been talking to you about, uh, but under the guise of altered states of consciousness. So things like uh, synesthesia, extra-dimensional percepts, uh, out-of-body experiences, near-death experiences, uh, entity encounters, alien abductions, sleep paralysis, uh, interspecies communication, which we're going to be talking to you mostly about tonight, and even experiences of what we call psi. So things like telepathy, clairvoyance, precognition, <coughs> and even psychokinesis. Uh, on some occasions. Now, this area of research that I'm looking at tonight, I've, I've chosen to speak specifically about eco-consciousness and psychedelics. I've talked more generally about psychedelics and consciousness, uh, but that's rather a large topic, so I'm just going to boil that down to a very specific talk. Um, but to give you a bit of an overview of where we've got to with current psychedelic research, uh, it's basically a redux of what was done in the 1960s and 1950s when this research uh, initially began. Uh, and a lot of that work was done in the clinical realms of finding treatments for difficult to treat psychogenic disorders like uh, depression, anxiety and addictions. Now, after a 50-year hiatus of, of research, we're now revisiting all that research again and we're finding very much the same thing. So these psychedelic substances have a lot of... Uh, benefit in treating, it seems initially, uh, difficult to treat psychological conditions. Beyond that, it's also expanding out and we're finding ever new kind of physiological uses of these substances as well. Uh, but I'm not going to go into that in, in too much detail. What I will say is that psychedelics as a whole, from the research, seem to enhance connectivity on, on, across the whole scale, across the whole spectrum of being, from the biological, the psychological, the sociological, the environmental, and even out to the kind of cosmic levels as well. So uh, recent neuroscience is showing that there is an increase of uh, interconnectivity between different regions of the brain. Uh, parts of your brain which don't ordinarily speak to each other uh, in a kind of 
normal state of consciousness suddenly begin communicating in, in new and novel ways, which gives rise to feelings of, of creativity, and fresh ideas, and so on and so forth, and even experiences of synesthesia. On the psychological level, we find the psychedelics enable us to connect with our own selves, to connect with our consciousness, with our own conscious mind, uh, and through that means that uh, people can find resolution of all kinds of uh, psychological problems and, and traumas. Um, they also increase connectivity on a psychosocial level as well. They, they enhance people's uh, empathy and compassion uh, that people have uh, an increased openness to experience after, uh, well, they can have an increase in openness to experience after a psychedelic experience. And on an environmental level, they also make us more connected with our environment as well, with other species and ecological uh, issues. On an even greater level, they connect us with, with the cosmos more, more globally, more generally, uh, more fantastically, if you like. Uh, so the specific point I'm going to look at today is uh, how psychedelics can help us enhance our ecological consciousness. Uh, and I would like to think that I've, I've formed a new area of a, a sub-sub-discipline of some existing areas of, of research. So we have psychology is a, an enormous subject field, we have ecology, and there's a little bit of overlap between the two, uh, mostly in the region of environmental psychology. There is another area of overlap as well, and that's what's called eco-psychology, which is more of a uh, psychotherapeutic angle, uh, and that's dealing with the very uh, everyday issues of uh, problems around our, our own psychological issues of, of being urban beings, uh, when we are actually naturally part of, the, of the, the wilder environment. So a lot of psychological distress and disease currently is, comes about through being in an urban environment. We've passed a tipping point maybe a few years ago, whereby there's more people living in urban environments than there are in rural environments. Uh, we have the rise of huge <coughs> megacities like Sao Paulo and Beijing. And uh, we find that urban diseases uh, are on the increase. Things like depression and anxiety and addictions are uh, much greater in urban environments. These are, these are urban diseases. So the focus of eco-psychology <laughs> is to identify the fact that we have become alienated through our, our environment, through our living in cities. And so the aim of uh, eco-psychology is to help us build a, a saner uh, and more healthy environment uh, and to reconnect us with nature. Um, and that may be through nature-based psychotherapy, uh, through shamanic counselling perhaps, or interspecies relationships. Um, so you can see that as a, as a kind of fusion between psychology and ecology, and I think somewhere in, within that, we have this notion of shamanism as well, uh, which is part of a broader kind of transpersonal psychology, if you like. For those of you who don't know, shamanism, you probably all do know, but shamanism is an ancient uh, technique of uh, psycho-magical praxis, uh, which we find all over the world. Uh, it's been around for thousands of years, presumably, whereby people go into an altered state of consciousness at will in the name of their community to transcend time and space, very much in an extended mind kind of way, and communicate with the spirits of nature and to bring back useful information for their community. It could be the location of uh, lost objects or uh, game to go and hunt or um, information from the future about in impending uh, disasters or so on. So shamans have this role and they've been doing this for a very long time and they get into altered states through whatever means available uh, and they usually begin with the letter D. Uh, so it could be dreaming, which you know everybody gets for free. That's quite convenient. Uh, drumming is also very popular uh, because it's very easy to have a kind of sonic drivers to get you into an altered state of consciousness. Other austerities like diets, uh, or also uh, dancing, or perhaps even drugs, what we might call drugs in the West, but these are obviously not considered to be drugs in the classic sense within shamanic cultures, what we might call psychedelic substances. Um, so there's the, the five Ds, they're the ways of accessing old states of consciousness typically used shamanically. Uh, but at its core, shamanism is a kind of nature-based epistemology. It, it, is, it comes to know the world through its interaction with nature. And shamans have many different roles, they're often healers, mediators, seers, psychopomps, uh, they could be tricksters and storytellers, poets, dancers, uh, spiritual gatekeepers for their community that mediate between 
the world of humans and the world of spirits and other species, uh, and they are very much caretakers of their environment, of nature itself. Uh, not least of all, their, their biggest job, uh, and uh, I wouldn't necessarily re recommend this for anyone if you want to become a shaman, it's, it's a big uh, task, we can all have shamanic experiences, but I think we all are, uh, have to take on this role to some extent, and that is they are caretakers of, of the world as well, and that's how they see it. Um, so, shamanism is this ancient praxis, uh, and uh, to give you a quote, this is, uh, this is a bit out of context, because I have the slides, but um, I've been working for many years with a tribe called the Waradika, the Wicholis, and um, part of their spiritual practice is to go on pilgrimage. Every year they travel great distances to go to their sacred sites and uh, interact with the spirits of nature in those places. But the, you know, the, the, the very topography itself is, is sacred, and their very, their very uh, practice of interaction is, is ecological. Um, to give you a quote from uh, a colleague of mine, David Lawler, said, ecologically, during the peyote hunt, because they use peyote in their practice, the Wicholas achieve a spiritual relation to their physical environment, not a neutral setting, not a mere place to live or exploit for a living. The very landscape is sanctified, the caves, the springs, the mountains, the rivers, the cactus groves, and the features of the mythical world are elevated to a cosmic significance. Plants and animals become only labels, conventions mere humans, human categories of thought. Distinctions between them are illusory. Man is nature. So, somewhere in within, they make use of peyote cactus, which is quite key, I should say. They're, they're somewhat like psychedelic monks, the Wish Onis. Uh, if you imagine kind of Tibetan Buddhist monks uh, engage a lot of uh, ritual practice, uh, the Wish Onis do most of the same thing, but they do it under the influence of peyote most of the time, which is a psychedelic uh, substance. Um, so, my, my own particular angle on this research uh, is coming from the realm of transpersonal psychology. So transpersonal psychology are those experiences whereby you go beyond your own ego identity, uh, transpersonal. And they may include a number of different things, like uh, communicating with spirits of nature, uh, experiences of telepathy and clairvoyance and so on. Now what we find is when people take psychedelic substances, the number of transpersonal experiences that they may have tends to rapidly increase. Uh, I could, could bedazzle you with some statistics, but for instance, uh, in the survey I conducted, 50% of people had taken a psychedelic had said they'd had an experience of telepathy whilst under the influence of that psychedelic substance. Um, now, if you compare that to other non-psychedelic drugs like caffeine or sugar or alcohol or crack, uh, people don't tend to have those kinds of telepathic-like experiences under the influence of those non-psychedelic drugs. So there's something very specific to psychedelic substances that induces these transpersonal-like experiences. Uh, further to that, I was very much interested in the kind of connections people have with their environment, with their, with their immediate ecosystem through their use of psychedelics. Um, there hadn't really been any research up until this point, although uh, consequently there's been uh, a couple of surveys since published, but uh, I'm going to talk to you about the, the research I did. Uh, I was very much interested in whether or not people had had uh, transpersonal experiences, whether they were in any way related to their uh, connection with nature, and whether it changed their attitudes about nature and the environment. Um, so, of, of the people who had taken psychedelics, we found that 100% of them had an increased connection with nature. People felt that because of their psychedelic experience, they felt more connected with nature as a result. Now, it didn't necessarily uh, equate into increased concern. About two-thirds of them felt more concern. But interestingly, about 15% felt less concerned about nature. Uh, and I'm not sure the very reasons of that, perhaps they felt that nature was getting on just fine without humans, thank you very much, and everything's going to be okay. What I also wanted to know is, is there a particular a psychedelic substance which increases people's both connection and concern for nature? Uh, what would be top of the pops? Would it be ayahuasca? Would it be ketamine? Would it be psilocybin? It turns out psilocybin mushrooms are probably our best chance uh, to... Uh, avert us from ecological disaster because people are taking those had uh, greatest increases of both concern and connection with, with nature. 
uh, whereas things like ketamine, which is actually dissociative anaesthetic, seem to reduce people's concern and connection. Ultimately, though, I wanted to know if not just changes in attitudes could be brought about through the use of psychedelics, but also changes in actual behaviour. Does it affect the way people actually conduct themselves if they've had one of these experiences? Um, the good news is that, yes, it, it does seem to do that. So, for instance, 58% uh, of people said they changed their diet as a result of their psychedelic experiences, uh, that people have begun uh, more vegan, more vegetarian, more local, uh, more organic, and so on and so forth. Uh, this is probably the real headline news, though. Now, we all know that since the 1960s, if you take LSD more than three times, you are by definition clinically insane. Uh, at least that's what we used to think. We don't now think that. Um, so these substances have this reputation of, of being extremely dangerous, uh, and I think we've managed to reverse a lot of those um, conceptions of psychedelics with, with this new wave of research. But perhaps the big headline news in my research is that psychedelics seem to have increased gardening uh, in over <laughs> half of the people who take them. Uh, this is terrifying headline news you won't find on the Daily Mail uh, anytime soon. That's right, half of the people who take psychedelics said it helped them increase their gardening activity, uh, which is the good news. Um, it also enhanced people's, uh, where people took more part in ecological activism, uh, they donated money to causes, they signed petitions, but for me, I think the most favourite statistic is that 16% of, of people who'd taken a psychedelic said that they changed their actual career as well as a, as a consequence of it, to something more ecologically orientated. And to give you an example, um, two people gave up the, the jobs they were doing to take up PhDs in botany as a direct result of their psychedelic experience. Um, what I was really interested in, though, was the, the kinds of transpersonal experiences that people have and whether or not these had an effect on, on their, their own perspective. Um, so I, I broke it down to a number of different categories uh, and uh, of the kinds of transpersonal people, experiences people may have in relationship to nature, so that people may have mythical encounters, encounters with little people, you know, spirits of nature, fairies and pixies, this kind of thing. People may have experiences of uh, encounters with hybrid beings, uh, so half human, half animal. People may have in encounters with the supposed intelligence of the, the plants or substances they're ingesting. Um, others have experiences of encountering uh, and communicating with other animals, uh, species. And on some occasions, people also have experiences of transformation themselves into other species. Um, so I looked at those, those kind of figures. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the boring percentage details of it, other than to say uh, about a quarter of, of the people in, in, uh, under various substances, such as psilocybin and ayahuasca, had these kinds of experiences. And these were key in making them more ecologically uh, attuned. Now, you may well say, well, obviously, they were completely delusioned and, and high as kites, and why, why should we pay any attention to these experiences? But it's, it's not necessarily pathological, and um, we've got to consider where we are currently in our current ecological crisis. Uh, it's not just climate change, it's, it's a climate catastrophe that we currently have going on. Uh, can we view those experiences as in, in any way more mad than what's going on currently in the world in our current ecological situation? And I'll leave you with a, a, a few quotes. So this is from Albert Hoffman, who was the discoverer, co-inventor of uh, LSD. Um, he said, LSD has given many people good ideas, and those who have gone back to nature have been saved. Many people, however, are still stuck in a technological hell and cannot get out. Nevertheless, many have discovered something that hardly exists in our society any longer, the sense of the sacred. Uh, this is a quote from uh, Paul Stamets. <laughs> He's probably the world's leading mycologist or expert on mushrooms. Uh, yeah, and uh, I was happy to say, I'm no mycologist myself. Um, but his, in his own experience, uh, he, he tends to believe that the, the psychedelic mushrooms are literally following us around as a species, and they, they want to communicate something to us. <laughs> That's what happens when you study psychedelic mushrooms. <laughs> 
So I'll give you this quote from Paul Stubbs. It said, psychedelic mushrooms proliferate in the wake of humans' habits of taming the land, such as chopping down trees, breaking ground to create roads and trails, and domesticating livestock. The message we receive from them is always that we are part of an ecology of consciousness, that the earth is in peril, that time is short, and we're part of a huge universal biosystem. Uh, and I'd like to finally leave you uh, with a quote from my own research uh, in collaboration with Stanley Krippner. And this is in, in the context of the idea then that uh, if you're having these transpersonal encounter experiences with nature under the influence of psychedelics, you are in some way mad. But which is the more mad? Communicating with the spirits of nature or sitting back while the Earth's ecosystem descends rapidly into the greatest wave of mass extinction in 65 million years? Uh, and I, you know, you're going to have to use your imagination here at this point. I'm going to show you a slide, a really kind of cheery slide to end on, uh, and that is the, the, the slide showing the, the uh, current species extinction, which kind of goes rather exponentially like that. And then uh, a really wonderful fit for that, that graph is uh, human population growth. I mean, it's no accident, I don't think, in the Anthropocene, that human population growth uh, is completely correlated with the species extinction. We're in the greatest wave of mass extinction in 65 million years. Um, what is it we're doing about it? What is the role of psychedelics uh, in that? Uh, but also all altered states of consciousness, be it through, it needn't be medication, it can be meditation as well, uh, and near-death experiences, all of these things tend to result in the right auspicious circumstances in the same end result, that people have heightened sense of empathy, uh, of compassion, increased connectivity, uh, a, a reduced fear of death. Uh, it makes you more uh, collectivist rather than individualistic. And I think that's something we greatly need in our current ecological climate. Thank you very much. Thank you.